the indigenous lands you're on in the chat. Um, and we'll be beginning shortly. Hi everyone, um, welcome to our second webinar in the Remembering Forward Just Transition webinar series. Um, we appreciate you all being here. If you haven't done so already, please um, put your name, pronouns, and Indigenous lands that you are on in the chat. Uh, questions can be put in the chat as well. Uh, just as a reminder, this uh, webinar will be recorded. My name is M. Taylor, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm an Unangan Inupiaq and Alutic youth organizer with Alaska Youth for Environmental Action. Um, I'm going to start off by giving a land acknowledgement and saying that I'm on the ancestral and unceded traditional territory of the Dena Ena peoples. The indigenous people of this land and the indigenous people all around Alaska never surrendered rights, lands, or resources to Russia or the United States. We acknowledge this not only in thanks to the indigenous communities who have stewarded, cared for, and held relationship with this land for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. Additionally, we acknowledge this as a point of reflection for us all as we work towards dismantling colonial practices. I'm gonna hand it off to David to talk about our partners in this webinar series. Hello, uh, my name is David Song, economic justice organizer with Native Movement and ACPERG. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm calling in from Aquan and Takuquan lands, AKA Juno. 
And I'm here to introduce our partners for a Just Recovery webinar series. Um, Fireweed Collective, Native Peoples Action, Fairbanks Climate and Action Coalition, the Alaska Center, ACPERG, and Native Movement. These are some of the organizations that co-hosted the Just Transition Summit in January. And if you're interested in learning more about what these organizations do, we'll be sharing out these links again with our post webinar feedback form. So this webinar is the first of a three-part series on different parts of the Just Transition framework, which we're adapting to Alaska and our current public health and economic crisis. So the goals of this series are to first reorient folks with the Just Transition framework as the summit was a while ago and we wanna refresh people's memories, um, build out our network of individuals and organizations that are passionate about transforming Alaska to benefit all people, um, connect campaigns and projects that are going on across the state. And we have some great examples and speakers planned for you today. And finally, learn how to transform this moment in a just way together. So I'm now going to pass it on to Denali who will ground us in the present moment and expand on why just transition is important in this current context. Hajjurga uh, Distin, Adet, Denali Hodgson's Ezra, Melinda Chase Singong, David Hodgson Sato, Gitunich Egg, South Naknik, Yith Histan, Fairbanks Listo. Good morning, everybody. In Dad's Dingata, how are you doing? Um, my name is Denali Hodgson and I go by she, they pronouns. I'm calling in from um, Lower Tanana Dene lands here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I'm originally from South Naknik and Anvik on the Yukon River and in Bristol Bay. Um, I wanted to start us off this morning by thinking about the season that we are in right now. In Deg Nag Athabaskan, we call it Hleg, which means spring. And as we're transitioning from spring into sun or the, the season of summer, I think it's important to really be mm, thinking about the lessons of growth that uh, our plant relatives are teaching us right now as they are springing forth from the earth. Uh, before getting on this call, I picked up um, Red Alert, which is, uh, oh, it's not popping up in my screen. There we go. <laughs> Red Alert, which is a book by Daniel R. Wildcat, and it's saving the planet with indigenous knowledge. And in Red Alert, um, Daniel Wildcat really grounds us in indigenous in ingenuity, um, otherwise called ingenuity. <laughs> and um, Curtis Kekaba of the Kwa Nation um, has really coined this term and he leads us forward in saying that indigenuity is the ability to solve pressing life issues facing humankind now by situating our solutions in earth-based local indigenous deep spatial knowledges. Tribal peoples constitute a practical merger of knowing with doing. And I think as we are thinking about a just transition framework, as well as the just recovery that we are facing right now in Alaska, it's important to really be centering um, this practical merger of knowing with doing. Um, Daniel R. Wildcat goes on to say that in order to live in life enhancing relations, humankind in industrial and post industrial societies must move beyond their self imposed physical, emotional, intellectual and spiritual imprisonment. And so this morning as we are moving forward in um, this webinar, I think it's important to really be thinking about the context in which we are coming into this present moment with. You know, we are seeing the third month, the beginning of the third month of the um, coronavirus. And uh, if you are still sheltering in place, good on you. Um, I think that that's honestly what we have to do right now. Um, right now, we are already seeing the influx of people coming into the state of Alaska uh, for different jobs, whether they are related to different small sectors of the tourism industry or the fishing industry, which is heavily impacting um, the villages in Southwest Alaska right now in my home of Bristol Bay. 
Um, in the larger context, you know, we have seen the fall of oil prices go below zero, something that I know that in my lifetime I didn't expect to see so soon and so rapidly. However, um, this current administration is looking at ways to be bailing out um, and really helping to continue to fund the oil and gas industry. Um, I was listening to uh, the radio yesterday and heard that J. Crew and a lot of other retailers have gone into and asked for bankruptcy, which means that they won't actually have to repay any of their debt. While we as people that are receiving small business loans from the United States are possibly going to be having to repay those, what does it mean when people are not able to actually repay um, these loans that are being given out and we are just piling on different types of debt within this country. Um, so I think at both the, the national scale and the um, international scale as well, and then of course within the state of Alaska, which we are going to be talking about today um, on all of our indigenous lands, it's so important that we are really grounding that deep knowing um, with doing and putting our, our words into action because we have, we have the knowledge systems that we need. Um, we have the, all of the written texts. <laughs> we have been doing research for a very long time. Now it's time for us to really that action behind our words. So um, I know that we will be closing out with a, with a visual today, and I'm really looking forward to um, possibly hearing everybody's reflections after that visualization and when we can imagine and put to action what our just transition and just recovery looks like here in Alaska. So with that, um, I will be passing it on to M to really speak more to a just recovery um, here in the state of Alaska and reground us in the just transition framework. How's your good Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Denali. Um, so just real quick, we're going to go over what a just transition is. A just transition is a framework for a fair shift to an economy that is ecologically sustainable, equitable, and just for all. Um, a transition is inevitable, but justice is not. Um, a just transition is really what we covered more in depth in our last webinar. And I believe a link to that webinar will be dropped in the chat and you can also find it um, on the website. And if we go to the next slide, um, this kind of shows the framework for a just transition. Um, it's really about a shift from an extractive to a regenerative economy and um, yeah, how we're gonna do that. So um, if we go to the next slide, it, we're talking more about um, a just recovery. Um, in Alaska, we're facing kind of parallel crisis. We have a health pandemic and a state economic disaster. And this pandemic has exposed the failures of our capitalist extractive economy. This has led to communities that are not just or resilient. However, we can use this recovery process to come together to confront these failures and create a new course onward that creates a regenerative and just economy in Alaska. This crisis has also um, exposed the inherent connections we have with each other and we can find um, creative ways to come together. So a just recovery really has three pillars, uh, respond, recover and rebuild. And we have a two pager that will be dropped in the chat and will be dropped on, uh, it'll be put on Facebook as well. Um, that really talks about a just recovery and these three pillars uh, in more detail. But starting with the first pillar is response instead of aid. So this directly responds to the needs of those most impacted and vulnerable. It's often in the form of mutual aid and support networks where communities are caring for each other. The second pillar of a just recovery is um, recover instead of extract. So this means we provide resources and support for all so we can have a path to livelihood that meets all of our needs. We also don't wanna let companies and disaster capitalists take advantage of the vulnerable during this time for their own gain. Um, and our last pillar of address recovery is rebuild and reimagine instead of displace. This means long-term rebuilding of communities so that they are stronger than they were prior to the disaster and are no longer highly vulnerable. 
we don't want to move forward with the same extractive economy and we want to rebuild towards a more uh, living and regenerative economy. Um, so that's kind of an overview of a just recovery. The two pager goes into a little more depth. Um, and next I'm going to pass it to Kendra to talk about um, indigenous economies. Great, thank you, Em. Uh, Kendra Kloster, I'm the Executive Director of Native Peoples Action, Native Peoples Action Community Fund. I'm currently here on the Nina lands. However, I've spent most of my life on Aquan, Taku, Kwan lands. And just great to be here with everyone. And thanks so much for joining us today. Some of the things I, I, I want to start, I want to touch on before we get into the um, just meat of this conversation is extractive versus regenerative versus indigenous economies. And what does that mean? And you can see the slide here, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, about it. We talk about a just transition as a unifying, a vision-led set of principles, processes, and practices that we're building this economic and political power shift uh, from an extractive economy to a regenerative re economy. This framework is structured and needs to create a fair shift so is equitable and just for Alaskans. This means like we're approaching the production and the consumption cycles in a holistically and waste-free. Taking it a step further, we must also look at it as an indigenous economy and uplifting our indigenous values and our culture, respecting the value and the gifts that mother earth provides. We have the land and the water and the animals. We are given rich foods like the salmon and we are facing many different things going on here in Alaska where our extractive economy is going to be jeopardizing our salmon. And this is not the type of economy and things that we want to do when we think about remembering forward. We need to look at the gifts that Mother Earth has given to us and use those gifts, such as if we're going to be looking at renewable energy rather than basing everything on an oil economy. And what I mean by that is we're gonna look at, we need to be looking forward into more tidal, geothermal, um, renewable type of energies that we can use that do not put our lands and our waters in jeopardy and are not putting our people in jeopardy as well. We can provide jobs and we can still live off the land. So we're, stri we're striving to create this new path forward and as I talked about, so remembering forward as we're living in harmony, but we're also doing this in cooperation. And living and living with Mother Earth, renewable gifts, and also doing this as cooperation. And we can look at the just the framework in coming together and doing this series and how we talk about working together. Our organizations, our people, we're coming together to really move our just transition forward and to move Alaska forward. And we can only do this by doing it together and through respect. And some of those examples that I just want to briefly talk on, talk on, but I want to get more into into the next uh, webinar series. Some of the things that we have been doing, for example, are going to include food sovereignty. What kind of things that we're looking at as we come in this pandemic? We've seen food shortages. Food, sorry, food shortages, supply chains that are disrupted, causing farmers to just euthanize their animals rather than using them. We're not doing this in, in a just and an equitable way, and we're not really respecting our land. We're not respecting our animals. We need to look at a holistic system when we're putting our families and our child and our children first. How are we doing childcare? We're rolling out systems without really thinking about our future. We're, we're, we're putting more of our funds into this capitalist society and forgetting like, how are we taking care of our families? We're just doing this, we're doing this backwards. So how are we gonna look into that? What policies can we do? We need to look at local and tribal governments and really focus more on giving them back the responsibility, looking to our tribes. And some things that we've done to move forward, like I said, we'll touch on more, but telehealth, um, we passed, there was a bill that was passed this year, House Bill 29, to expand insurance for telehealth and making sure all Alaskans have access. 
We're also looking at access to more affordable internet. What are things that we can do? Um, companies like GCI, they you know drop some of the prices. We made it more affor affordable for families, but why is it taking a pandemic to make this more affordable? Why can't everyone have access to broadband, which opens up worlds to education and working from home to ensure that everybody is being safe? So we'll get into that a little bit more, like I said, in the next one. But really, if we're looking at this in a holistic way, it's it's understanding and respecting our indigenous economies, it's cooperation, it's looking to our tribal governments, it's working together, it's getting away from this extractive economy that Alaska has been living in since the 70s and everything being based on this oil economy. And as we see as our oil price is dropping, what's really happening is bailouts. We need to make this shift and we need to make this shift into, into a just equitable way and and remembering forward with our indigenous leaders who've lived on these lands for thousands of years. And hopefully that helped just kind of ground us a little bit more and looking at what we want to do moving forward. And I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey now. Baka. Uh, communications director Algo, Native Peoples Action, Native Peoples Action Community Fund, AMI. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kelsey Jugan Wallace. I am originally from Bethel, uh, but I currently live and work here um, on Denaina lands near the native village of Biklutna. I uh, come to this space as a mom um, and also as a communications director for Native Peoples Action and Native Peoples Action Community Fund. My pronouns are she, her. It's really good to see everybody and share this space with you all today. Um, so this next slide, we're, what we're going over um, or what we're looking at is, uh, you know, what does community care look like here in Alaska? What are ways that our communities and our people are stepping up to take care of one another now in the midst of a disaster? Um, we we have had to really work together to navigate this current reality and, and confront the changes that need to be made in order for our people across the state to be well. And we've really seen awesome examples of people and communities stepping up and stepping into their power of cultivating resiliency by developing different adaptation strategies. You know, these strategies are really centered around taking care of one another. This is what community care looks like. There are many examples of folks in both rural and urban communities throughout Alaska who are going out of their way to support one another right now. And some of um, some examples of this community care include, you know, community coordinated shopping, food banks throughout Alaska, sharing our subsistence foods through care packages with elders and families. Um, also, you know, different organizations and people movers who are putting together care packages for, um, for new mothers and for, for elders and for loved ones who may be struggling a little bit right now. And also by recreating a sense of community with an online platform such as this one. Other examples of community care include organizing to take care of our most vulnerable right now. Our elders, you know, like I said, making sure they have what they need. Our homeless relatives um, by providing shelter and different screening processes to make sure that they're healthy too. Um, taking care of our immunocompromised folks or folks who have immunocompromised systems by um, community organized mass making um, and also by practicing and continuing to practice, you know, physical distancing and keeping our good hand hygiene. Um, and also, you know, really taking care of each other for the sake of our kids, you know, making sure that we are organizing and doing this um, 
organizing of community care in a good way and setting this good example for them. So, you know, how do we move forward as a collective living in this value of community care right now and into the future? Not just in the face of a pandemic, but how do we take this mindset of community care and live it in truth moving forward? So right now I want to introduce our two guest speakers today. We have um, Margaret Olin Hoffman David and Julia Nunek Terry. They're going to tell us um, more about what you know community care looks like right now. So if we can change the slide over first, we have Margaret. Um, some of us know her as Mo. She was born and raised here in Alaska, and she grew up spending summers at her grandparents' fish camp on the Yukon River, and is rooted by her Koyukon Athabascan culture. Um, through 12, 12 years of working in tribal and rural community health promotion and program management, birthing her family, volunteering as a doula, and healing through native ways of knowing, she really realized her calling to midwifery. She you know, understands the potential we have to heal ourselves and to heal our ancestors during the transformation of childbirth which is why she has chosen to, to dedicate her life's work to midwifery. By becoming a certified nurse midwife, she hopes to expand um, prenatal community health programs and birthing options for rural Alaska Native women by remembering traditional practices and supporting more pathways for indigenous birth workers. She lives here in Anchorage with her partner and has four children and is currently a midwife at the Alaska Native Medical Center. And I just wanna give her a real big shout out. She was my midwife and was completely awesome. So Mo, if you wanna take it away. On the Zoom, Gi'i Doidama Su'uza, Margaret Owen Hoffman, David Su'uza, Tlaege Utan Islan, Betikte Utana Islan, Tla Loga Utan Sadantalet, Anchorage Lesto, and Danaka Hero Horoga E, learning my language. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Thank you for the invite to participate in this conversation. Um, this is just really awesome. Um, I, my, I'm from the interior region of Alaska, uh, from the area around Cochrane's and Ruby. Tla'aloga is a place between the two bluffs. And um, like Kelsey mentioned, I now live and work on Denina lands in Dekayakak, the mouth of uh, needlefish um, here in Anchorage. And am grateful to be working as a midwife in our tribal health system. <clears throat> so I was asked to share a couple of things about a couple of different things happening in response to the pandemic happening right now. Um, here um, at ANMC, there's been some kind of adaptations to the ways that we're providing care like through telehealth. Um, so I'll talk about some of that. And then also, um, I'm really happy to be part of the Alaska Native Birth Workers community. Um, so I'll tell a little bit about that group, how we formed and some of the things that we've been able to do um, in response as well. And then just some other thoughts about um, reclaiming birth in our communities that I'll share at the end. And I also just want to um, say that I'm representing myself. I'm here um, at work right now, but I'm on my lunch break. I'm not representing a &MC or um, South Central Foundation right now. I'm just representing myself as a Koyaka midwife, um, just to be clear about that. And I use uh, she, her pronouns. <clears throat> So right now, um, our midwifery group at South Central Foundation, we usually work in the clinic and in the hospital on labor and delivery a couple of days a week in each. And what we've done just to minimize exposure of going back and forth between the clinic and the hospital right now is have groups 
a group of our midwives that are working just in clinic and then a group of midwives that are working just in the hospital. So I've just been working in clinic. I haven't been on labor and delivery in a while and I really miss it. But um, so I don't, we're, we're in communication, but I haven't actually been working in the hospital like during this um, period of, you know, hunkering down. Um, I've just been in the clinic. Um, so prenatal care and postpartum care and birth control care are considered essential. People are still pregnant and having their babies, um, so we can't stop any of those services. And so we're continuing to see people um, here in the clinic for their prenatal visits. And if we're able to, we're trying to space out appointments if it's okay, you know, with the with the pregnant person, you know, if they feel comfortable, um, you know, not coming into the clinic as often just to minimize exposure. Um, we're kind of spacing out appointments and also um, doing more phone visits. So kind of alternating, you know, in clinic visits and phone visits. Um, again, if the person's, you know, comfortable not coming in in person and, you know, checking heart tones and their blood pressure and all of that. Um, and that's been going um, pretty well. And it's kind of nice to have a different way of um, communicating with people too. Sometimes people feel more comfortable telling us more on the phone than they do in in-person visits, or sometimes they're, you know, they're really busy, like a lot of us, you know, working at home and helping kids with online school at home are really busy. And so sometimes the visits are just really fast too. Like they're busy, like everything's good, I'm fine. Okay, see you next time. <laughs> yes, baby's moving. <laughs> um, so it just kind of varies, but um, also there's, you know, towards the end of, of pregnancy, we like to see people more often. And, you know, usually those visits are in person and some people have just been really you know, appropriately nervous about coming into the hospital or clinic if they don't absolutely have to. And there's, you know, been some people that have not been wanting to come in, to, you know, for their prenatal visit. So we've been working with people where they're at. I've done like a couple of parking lot visits where they drive up and I run down with a blood pressure cuff and, um, you know, the Doppler to um, check on them in their car. Um, I've worked with people where if they have labs due um, and they don't want to come into clinic, I'll leave the, you know, swabs or whatever we're going to collect for some of their prenatal labs um, at the front desk for them and their partner or somebody will come get it for them, bring it home, they'll self-collect their swabs and then come drop it off and then we'll still do the labs um, that they wanted to do without them having to come into the clinic. So we're... Um, just trying to meet people with, with where they're at. People are very stressed, you know, of course, um, being pregnant right now and welcoming a newborn with all of this going on. It's just with, you know, a lot of the unknowns too. Um, it's very stressful. Um, and in kind of hearing that, you know, the first couple of weeks that this was happening, a lot of our visits was just, you know, just sitting with people through this as we're kind of figuring things out together. Um, and I was just hearing people stress, you know, like again and again with each, each visit. And our birth workers group, um, which I'll um, explain a little bit more about in a minute, but um, we responded by putting together some care packages. Um, one of the things that I was hearing, you know, people, rural people that come into Anchorage for care towards the end of their pregnancy, um, you know, staying at patient housing here on campus, um, the cafeterias are closed just because they're trying to, you know, keep people apart from each other. And so meals are being delivered to their rooms and um, instead of them going down to the cafeteria to pick out what to eat, you know, when they want to. <laughs> and at the beginning, some people were saying like the meals weren't things that they like to eat or they, it wasn't enough. And, 
when you're pregnant, it, we like to eat, um, you know, more often than just three meals a day, because it takes a lot of energy to grow a human being. So not getting enough snacks. So one of the first things we did was um, get together some snack bags that we're able to, you know, share with people when they come into their clinic visits. Um, I have some good like protein snacks and um, good prenatal snacks. Um, and another thing that um, our clinic has been doing for a long time, like some of the midwives here have been doing it for a long time, um, just kind of pooling together um, money that people donate to purchase some food bags, kind of, you know, as emergency food bags are really just meant to help hold um, people over for a couple of days as they're getting connected to longer term resources. But if we hear that people are hungry, um, we have some food bags available in the clinic with you know, some shelf stable, you know, high protein um, foods. Um, so we, uh, our birth workers group refilled the food bag supply and got a bunch of snack bags together pretty quickly. And then another thing that we've been working on, and Lena's on, um, she's sharing the link to our group in the chat box. Um, another thing that we got together, put together recently were some comfort packs or some pregnancy care packages um, for just kind of some extra, you know, love and care for people um, as they're, here in town waiting, you know, oftentimes alone because um, their travel, you know, travel for a support person is not supported through, you know, Medicaid or our tribal health system, which is a whole other thing that maybe we'll continue talking about in the future. But oftentimes people are here alone, you know, waiting, they're away from their support systems, from their families, sometimes, you know, not used to being in Anchorage and um, and then also, you know, with this pandemic stuff on, a lot of people are even just scared to leave their rooms um, at patient housing. So anyway, we put together these um, comfort packs that have some teas and chocolate and some coloring pages and um, some hand sanitizer and chapstick and... I think that's when them, and they're all in like a, a, ma a pint size mason jar that, you know, they can use for their, for their tea. Um, and we have a lot of other ideas and ways that we want to support. I'd really like to, I really love how people are able to connect more easily now through all these online platforms. And we're hoping to get some, you know, prenatal or, you know, peri, um, prenatal postpartum um, talking circles going online to just hold space for people as, as we're going through this together. <clears throat> so these pictures that are up on the slide, um, the one on the right, the, um, that is from a gathering that we hosted here in 2017 um, when I was in Oh, okay, two, two minutes. Um, it was a uh, indigenous birth workers gathering. And in this photo, there's people from all over the States and Canada um, that came together. And out of that gathering, I think is where um, those of us on the left um, really connected and kept um, in touch and move forward with creating the Alaska Native birth workers community. And we're just been a community-based, you know, kind of grassroots volunteer group trying to fill in needs as we hear um, of them and um, volunteer to support people during labor, um, birth, postpartum. And we've become more formalized over this last year and um, have a couple of trainings coming up when we're able to have in-person gatherings. Um, some of the other thoughts that I was, you know, thinking about, um, and I just have like another minute, but um, in thinking about dress transition and remembering forward and our care for each other, um, where 
is caring, you know, for pregnant people, for childbearing people, birthing people um, in this. Right now, the way our health care is set up is they're pretty, med like childbirth is pretty medicalized and it's centralized. So rural people are required to, you know, leave their homes to give birth at their regional hospital or for any high risk reason are referred, you know, into Anchorage to birth at AMC. Um, so right away, you know, rural Alaska Native people are born disconnected from our homelands and, um, and that's a big, that's a big thing for me. But anyway, like in remembering forward, how do we remember our responsibility for caring for each other during this time and being prepared um, to be able to care for each other skillfully, you know, during this time in life, instead of relying on, a, you know, a medical system to take care of us. Um, you know, we hear stories about our grandpas or, you know, other, you know, relatives are, you know, being born at fish camp or on the trap line and how it was their sisters or mothers or aunties or grandmas or um, partners that cared for them during that time. Like we had those survival skills for helping each other during labor and birth. And um, I guess I just wanted to put those thoughts out there. Like how do we remember forward in um, taking care of each other in that way too. And I think my time is up. So I will pass it back to um, Kelsey to introduce uh, Julia, the next speak speaker, Basi. Boyana Mo for sharing. Um, that was so awesome to listen to. Uh, so our next speaker is Julia Terry. Julia Nunik Terry is um, a queer, polyamorous, uh, cisgender, poor, white, anti-racist mother raised on Yupik in Lower Tanana lands. Her paid work with Choosing Our Roots and unpaid labor in the world involves community building to create safer spaces. So thanks, Julia, for sending that intro over and um, I will pass it over to you to um, take it away from here. See. Um, I'm really grateful to be here today. I was just looking through the list of participants and seeing so many familiar faces and new faces too. And it just sort of cracks my heart wide open to know how connected we all are. So I wanted to express that gratitude. Um, as mentioned, my name's Julia. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I currently live on Denai Ina lands here in Anchorage. But I was raised in Nuktak and Tuxuk Bay um, on the Yukon Koyukuk Delta, as well as in Fairbanks on Lower Tanana lands. Uh, my parents are Barbara and Terry McCarthy. They currently live in Fairbanks. And my grandparents were born in Ireland, um, Italy, and Germany. I'm Nuni. My name was given to me by the late Louise Nunik Aganach from Tuxuk Bay. Um, my Yupik family is the Kasaili family and the Tom family in Nuktak. And some of them are now in Mumtuaituk. Um, and some of them, I think, are moving to the new village site, though I don't know all of the details of that. And I always want to acknowledge that I was grateful to um, listen to Mo talking about caring for one another. I like to acknowledge my first mother, Teresa Lincoln, in Tuxuk Bay for all that she gave to me. Um, as I was thinking today about how to talk about communities of care and all of the ways that we support one another, I came to realize that I don't think that there's a single community that I've been in that isn't a community of care. Um, and I just sort of wanna name those because as I'm looking through the faces and the names here on this list, I know that some of you are grievers and that we came to know one another through the Forget Me Not Bereavement program or through shared loss experience. Um, some of you are part of my disability community and being part of a community that um, understands what access is, is really important to me. Um, I met some people that are on this list through work about 25 years ago in Food Not Bombs, addressing food insecurity in both urban, semi-urban and rural areas of Alaska. 
Um, choosing our roots, which we mentioned earlier, is uh, my heart work right now. I work with a number of people in a collaborative community of volunteers to house lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, and gender expansive young people who are houseless into affirming households. Um, my village family is essential to my well being. And uh, there are a couple of people that are on this call who have been working alongside me and many others in forming a mutual aid network here in Anchorage, specifically to address some of the issues around COVID-19, which we've discussed, lack of access to resource, et cetera. Look at the slide here really quickly and show that up here in the left-hand, I think it's left-hand corner, sorry, I always get confused by technology. Um, in the beautiful parka, that is my namesake, Luis. In the red hat, that is Teresa. Um, with lots and lots of children over here in the corner is Monica Casayoli. These are my parents. Um, this is a really old picture of them. I couldn't find a newer picture of them. Uh, and then this large picture right here is a very small segment of the community that makes up Choosing Our Roots. Um, and I just want to point out all of those people because I think that we're, we need each other. And that's really the core of everything that I know from the work that I do with Choosing Our Roots, the work that I do in mutual aid, um, is that the ways that we get through any of the hard things in life is by healing ourselves while healing one another and that it's all interconnected. Um, so some of the things that I specifically was thinking about from my childhood is that indigenous ways of knowledge have really informed things that um, are the threads that tie all of the aspects of my life together. Um, that we always have enough because we have one another and that sharing what we have makes us richer. Um, that as long as I have something that I can give and something that I'm willing to receive, I grow from that experience. Um, that it's really important that the things that we do, we do with intention and that we live carefully in this world because it always has impact. And that is about our interactions with one another, our interactions with the earth, our interactions with people that we maybe don't have immediate affinity towards. I like to think a lot about when I have a initial response to somebody that is kind of cranky, how do I find the common ground and the common language? Um, because that's another thing that's really important. Language ties us together. And when I've been thinking about um, sort of this highlighting of mutual aid networks in this time of pandemic, I've come to understand that language of mutual aid is about a translation platform because we all know how to do these things naturally. Um, we know how to care for one another. Some of us are parts of um, religious communities. I'm a person who's married to a transgender minister, which is always really confusing to me because I'm very agnostic. But one of the things that I love about religious communities is that they often already have networks of caring for elders, people who are immune compromised, caring for people that have young children. Um, as I was growing up, all of my Anans and all of my other family members were always bringing in the younger children in the community to teach them and to show them how to care for one another in an ongoing way. And um, because of that understanding that it's our responsibility to reach out to one another, um, I joined with a number of other people um, first, a few years ago to start choosing our roots, um, I just got a time warning over here and I always get confused about those things. So uh, hopefully I'll touch on all of the things I meant to. But um, when we formed choosing our roots, our main objective was to say, how do we care for all of these young people who are finding themselves houseless and that helps them to heal and be connected to all of the things that they find culturally relevant. Um, and in Alaska, you know, 40% of our houseless young people are indigenous and probably another 40% of those people with intersections are lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, um, or gender expansive. And so we know that those young people really need supportive and affirming community in order to thrive um, and in order to support one another. 
I'll put a little thing over there in the chat in just a minute so that you can check out Choosing Our Roots because we need you. Um, all over the state, we need you. We need to know what you need in your community. We need to know how you support young people. Um, and I wanna also just mention um, Annie Huntington Kriska, who was my first host home when I became homeless at 14 and took me in and cared for me um, and taught me how to be in the world. Um, I wanna move really quickly to the Mutual Aid Network of Anchorage because I think it's one of these things that I just feel amazed by all of the time. You know, as soon as we started to see um, closures here in Alaska around COVID-19, I got online and I started saying, how are we caring for our elderly people? I live in Mountain View. Um, I know most of my neighbors I, in my little neighborhood, um, which is about four blocks, but I don't know people throughout Mountain View. And we're a population dense neighborhood with um, lots of languages spoken here and lots of people who are homebound. So the question was, how do we care for one another, not only through this pandemic, but how are we already caring for one another and how can we um, encourage that and um, continue that into our future. I think a lot of uh, focal points around mutual aid uh, is creating a network within your smaller community so that you know who to reach out to when you are lacking a resource. And the thing is that this isn't new, right? We talk a lot about um, remembering forward. And I think that um, our systems of extractive um, economies are fear-based and they disconnect us from one another. And when we begin to think about how to be um, regenerative and connecting to one another and carrying this on into our future, um, we come to know that we truly have all of the things that our communities need to survive. And when we have a community that has larger barriers, we can look beyond that community to all of the rest of the communities and say, how can we help one another and float ourselves through? This is a lot of time of talking and I'm kind of tired of hearing myself talk, <laughs> um, but I'm so appreciative to be part of all of these um, communities and all of the ways that, uh, that you help me to heal every day. I woke up this morning and I was super angry um, and feeling kind of hopeless. And as soon as I got on here and I started listening to all of the knowledge that you all have to share, the hope came back. So thank you. And thanks for letting me be here today for a little bit. All right, thank you, Julia. And thank you um, to all of our speakers beforehand. Um, my name is Katie McKenna. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm on the Aquan Taku Kwan lands, also known as Juno. And so I'm a part of the Juno Ea group, so Alaskan Youth for Environmental Action, and I'm really, really excited to help facilitate the breakout groups today. So for the past hour or so, we've been able to see just how important communities of care are for response in a just transition, as opposed to aid or bailout, especially in Alaska during times of crisis. I mean, we've seen examples of others taking care of their communities, from supplying food banks, to showing gratitude for and learning from traditional cultures and economies, to providing shelter for our vulnerable community members. So now, as we move into breakout groups, we want to explore how we can use the just transition framework of respond, recovery, and rebuild and imagine, reimagine, excuse me, to continue to help our own communities create and support systems and projects that prioritize health for, for our environment and for our neighbors. So you will be placed into a group of roughly five people, including a facilitator who will help guide the discussion. You'll have roughly 20 minutes to discuss and respond to the question of, how do we respond justly to our, communi to our communities and decision makers as our policymakers fail to prioritize communities and health? And if you have time, there'll be um, an optional question of how do we grow policy from a community response rather than from aid? So I encourage you to think about how your work can tie into our overall goals of a just transition. And other than that, have fun, be creative, and get ready to dive in. So I think now we'll be broken up into breakout groups. There'll be a little bit of transition, but thank you for being patient.
Hi everyone, welcome back. If you can go one more slide, Ryan, that would be awesome. Thank you. So as we come back, we just wanted to show some inspiring images from, um, well, we as human beings are reclaiming what is possible during this crisis. We have ecosystems that are also reclaiming what is possible. Um, you have plankton coming back to oceans, air cleaning up itself in India, um, dolphins coming back up canals in, um, in Italy. So just remembering like the opportunity that is this moment um, right now, not only for us, but for all of the ecosystems um, that are getting a rest from our, our actions right now feels like a good thing. So I wanna ask everybody, um, we're gonna take the resources that were shared throughout the Zoom and share out an email with you um, soon, but we're just gonna wait a few more minutes for people to come back from their virtual rooms to apparate back to us from the world of mystery and enchantment that is Zoom. Um, I am Jessica Gerard. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. And I am on the lower Tanana Dene people's lands um, in Fairbanks, Alaska. And um, Nithya and I um, are gonna just do a little bit of a closing with everybody now, but we really wanted to take a minute and have people add to the chat some light bulb moments about ways that you wanna push yourself or your policymakers um, into, uh, into a notion of just recovery. And I think a big question that folks have is what is the difference between just transition and just recovery? And just transition in our minds is this longer conversation about strategies to move us forward throughout any moment, right? They acknowledge that we live in extractive economy right now and that we are using strategies um, such as divestment and other economic strategies to move us to an economy that is regenerative or an indigenous economy like Kendra was addressing um, at the beginning of our webinar. So in that two pager um, that Kelsey will drop in right now um, and that we've dropped in a few times, there's really good definitions about the difference between just recovery and just transition. And just recovery is a response using the just transition framework and those strategies and a time bound response. And we just wanna give credit to um, Puerto Ricans because they definitely came up with this process. And Sama, I saw you on the phone earlier, solidarity with Puerto Rico. Um, those folks came up with this, this framework that we're using um, to address um, one of their hurricanes that had happened and decimated the entire island. And so a just recovery is a time bound strategy that gets us to a place of recovering tremendous gains and opportunities in a moment of crisis. So the things that we're seeing, particularly around like um, everyone being get or everyone that has filed their taxes is getting a $1,200 stipend, right? That is something that movements have been pushing for since the Occupy movement um, for a single based economy for everybody. And so these things are possible. And how do we use those moments in a recovery of a crisis moment? So we are in one crisis right now called this pandemic of COVID. But we also recognize that we're in a crisis that is systemic from colonization and capitalism as well. So check out that, um, that two pager. It gives a lot of definitions between the time bound response of recovery so when we're talking about a recovery right now, we're talking about immediate steps to not have any more disaster capitalist policies put forward, but rather um, policies that help, can help us justly transition to a regenerative economy. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to Nithya um, to share some other resources um, that we wanted to bring out before we left today. Hi all, uh, my name is Nithya, uh, pronouns are she, her, and I am on Denina lands today, calling from Anchorage. Um, yeah, so as Jessica mentioned, I just wanted to um, kind of close us out by sharing some resources and also some specific things that we can kind of walk away with um, as we move forward in terms of really, you know, definitive action. First, I wanted to share with you 
Um, something that's being done right now is to collect um, stories for a COVID sto story bank. Um, and this story bank is collecting stories of financial impacts. Um, and this is being used to directly um, be sent to policymakers and legislators as well. Um, and I believe Jessica will be sharing anything that I'm mentioning um, down in the chat box below. Um, so that's one thing that we wanted to kind of highlight for you. Um, another thing that we wanted to highlight, and Jessica did a really beautiful job of kind of moving us through explaining um, what this just transition framework will look like. Um, but we also have a toolkit online. So if you go to justtransitionak.org, you can find the toolkit there and that'll explain a little bit more for you about how to kind of integrate this, this idea, these ideas and frameworks uh, into the work that you all are doing in your communities. Um, next thing to highlight was um, asking um, our legislators to um, pass something to make sure that we can have access to vote by mail. Um, and so I believe Jessica will share a little bit of information about how to contact your legislators about that and urge them uh, to make sure that every Alaskan has um, is able to um, And then as mentioned before, at the beginning of the webinar, um, we have a two-pager document that I think will really help folks kind of plug into specific areas that they're interested in. Um, so that was dropped earlier in the chat, but if Jessica could drop that again, that would be awesome. Um, just to get a sense of, um, yeah, different areas where you can get involved. And then uh, finally, we've got another webinar. So um, if you'd like to register for our next webinar, um, you can head to the website again or to our Facebook page. And that next webinar will be held on May 20th and we'll be focusing on resilience and community recovery. Um, yeah, that's about it in terms of resources. Um, and so finally to kind of close out the space, um, something that I wanted to do is to sort of bring us back and ground us in the moment and what we're hoping to kind of take away from this as we've spoken with each other um, in this space. Um, so what I wanted to do was to kind of close out with this sort of um, vision, uh, visionary meditation kind of exercise. Um, and so everyone, um, you know, if you feel comfortable to do so to kind of get, get seated where you are, um, just kind of take a deep breath. Um, and what I like you to do is if you feel comfortable doing so is to just close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, I'd like you to, um, to imagine your community. And as you're imagining your community, I'd like you to think about this community as you'd like it to be in the future. And as you take that in, imagine what surrounds you and begin walking through your community. As you walk through your community, I want you to think about what you see and who do you see around you. As you look at the people around you, Think about what these people are doing and take a moment to really let their actions sink in and think about how those actions are making you feel in that moment as you walk through. Now I want you to keep envisioning that community and together I want us all to kind of take a deep collective breath in and as you do so, I want you to imagine into existence what's possible for us as a community. And now slowly, I'd like you all to breathe out, releasing all of the tension, stress, and fears that you've been holding on today. And when you're ready, I'd like you to open your eyes. Awesome. So thank you so much. Um, again, I just wanna encourage you all to think about um, some of these specific policies um, and actions that we can take and, but overall to really be thinking about 
um, how this framework can really help move us forward and um, what we can imagine into reality as we move forward together. So thank you all so much. Um, and I'll hand it back to Jess in case you wanna close out with anything. No, that was amazing, Nithya. Thank you. 